you haven't been with us before, we are going through the book of Esther in a series we're calling Seeing the Unseen, as this is a book that we never once see the Lord's name clearly mentioned within it, and yet, obviously, through all of it, um, we see his hand at work. Because we did announcements a little different today, we, we had kept junior high in for part of this, but if you are in junior high at this time, you can make your way to the lobby and You'll be heading to youth church this morning. But I have one more announcement I want to make um, before we head into our study of Esther chapter 7, and it's regarding worship. Now, a little disclaimer as we begin. If this is your first Sunday here, you're just visiting this morning, it's still a great word to heed, but this is more so to, to address the people who regularly call Crossroads home. Um, For some time now, we've begun to notice kind of a a habit that's beginning to form. The the five to ten minutes into service kind of trickle in, and and even how uh, if you were to count the number of people within service from the beginning of worship to uh, after the first or second song, how the number about doubles in here. And it's, it's begun to cause a little bit of concern in us as a team to the point that I really felt like We need to address it. Now, I'm not against fellowship by any means, and I know it's great to catch up with someone in the lobby, and yet um, I think we need to be very serious about the way we approach and address the worship of the Lord in our service. Worship as a believer, I I don't have to tell you this, it's not optional. It's it's a command clearly given throughout Scripture. It's something the Lord deserves and is worthy of, and it's something we're created to do, is to worship Him. No matter our musical ability, no matter our, our preference to the style of the music that is being played, no matter the number of instruments that are up here or how the lyrics are displayed on the screen, as Psalm 156 150 verse 6 would say, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's you and that's me. 1 Chronicles 16.29 describes worship in this way. It says, give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We don't see worship here as the music that, that lets you know you should begin to slowly go and find your seat or, or the elevator background music as you kind of meet and greet in the lobby. No, worship is an essential part of our service here and something that we want you to be a part of from the first moment it begins until the very end. And that's because as scripture clearly tells us, worship is actually for your benefit It's in the worship of or with song that our hearts are prepared to receive the word, which in turn causes us to respond to that word by once again worshiping the Lord. We show up better to the word when our hearts are readied in worship. And then it is the word that informs us not only how we are to worship, but the God who is worthy of that worship. In Colossians 3, 16 and 17, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Ultimately, the issue is not that we want more people in the room singing together when we start. It's a matter of leading the people in this church well and allowing anyone to believe that worship is just the opening credits for the main event and treating it less like the priority it's meant to be is not leading well and would be both a misuse of our leadership, but also a detriment to all of our spiritual well-beings. There are practical reasons 
why it's best that you would be here as we begin worship. It's distracting. It can be hard to to find who you're trying to sit with or to get to your seat or even for the team leading in worship. But ultimately, neglecting to be here for all of worship, it's a value statement, whether we realize it or not. When you go to the, the ball game for your kid and they sing the national anthem, you stand up and you put your hand over your heart and you take off that hat and you sing out proudly because you've been blessed to live in this country and you want to honor those who have sacrificed to make that possible. Not everyone sings in key. (laughs) There's often not any instruments at all and yet there is an attention there. There is an honor there. There is a respect there given because we value what's being done and what it represents. Worship isn't all that different. God is worthy to receive praise regardless of how we feel because of who he is and because of what he has sacrificed to bring us the spiritual freedom we enjoy today. My fear is that we're allowing the culture to slowly cause us to slip into a habit of devaluing the worship of God and dishonoring his holy name. I mean, just think about it. If we were consistently 10 to 15 minutes late to work, we'd be out of a job. If our kids were consistently dropped off 10 to 15 minutes late to school each and every day, we'd be hearing from the staff at that school. And if you were consistently showing up 10 to 15 minutes late for a date, I have a wake-up call for you. A breakup is coming. (laughs) But if we as a people who have been saved from hell and blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, who have been brought out of darkness into marvelous light and are called children of God, cannot muster up the discipline to say, I'm going to get there by 930. I'm going to be in that pew and I am ready to worship the Lord. There's an issue that needs to be addressed and remedied. Now, I don't share this because my hope is that I can guilt you or somehow try and strong arm you into worshiping. I'm not going to dishonor the Lord in that way. He deserves to be worshiped. He is worthy of your worship, and I'm not going to try and convince you of it. But I do want to address those who have become casual about showing up on time about making it a priority to come and worship the Lord together because it's not. And my heart is that each and every one of us would see this as such a priority, so important that we would do everything necessary to get here on time. Now, I understand there are off days. There's the day you spill on yourself your breakfast and you have to go change There's the mom with four or five kids, some still in diapers, and you're just trying to get everybody here with their clothes on the right way and no food in their hair, okay? There's grace for that. We're very much in that season ourselves. That's not what I'm speaking to, but I'm speaking to a a casual kind of demeanor when it comes to the priority of worship and giving the Lord the respect due his name. Well, with that being said, please turn with me to, uh, not Acts, Esther chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Here's what we read. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you, and what is your request? Up to half the kingdom it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So the king Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he? 
Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. Then the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine. Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was, and the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now Harbanah, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. And the king said, hang him on it. And so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. Would you join me as we open in prayer this morning? Father, we come before your word this morning, recognizing that although your name is not clearly written in this text, your hand is clearly seen at work. God, we come before your word this morning as a people who recognize our need for truth, that it would shape us, that it would mold us, that it would guide our lives and inform the way we think, that it would renew our minds. Lord, we pray you would prepare our hearts for the word you have this morning, that you would give us spiritual eyes to see the truth within your text, that you would give us a readiness of heart to apply that which we receive God, that you would give us the humility this morning as as you speak through your word, not to think of how it might apply to someone else, or not to quickly dismiss its instruction, but God, that we would have the humility to allow it to expose those things within us that need to be addressed. Where there is blindness, Lord, within our own lives, would you bring clarity? Lord, where there is pride, would you bring humility? God, where there is coldness, would you, our consuming fire, once again revive that desire within us, that zeal, that we would be a people that do not grow weary when doing good. We thank you for this time this morning that we have to come together. Would it be redeemed? Would it be glorifying to you? And it's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Well, if you're taking notes this morning, you want to write down a title, you can write this down this morning in Esther chapter 7, the title, Hanging with Haman. Hanging with Haman. This is probably one of those titles I should have just gone past and moved on to something else, but we're sticking with it this morning. Hanging with Haman. Well, I was reading this week about an invention, the radar. It was, an inv- it was invented by a, a Scotsman by the name of Robert Watson Watt. He was later knighted for his work in the military as it was greatly used in war. And the invention of the radar received $140,000 the largest sum ever awarded for a wartime invention. However, later on, when Sir Robert Watson Watt was driving in Canada, he was pulled over for speeding, getting caught by a radar trap. Many of you can relate this morning. You've been there. 
over irony. Well, later he wrote a verse about it. I want to read to you this morning. He said this, Pity Sir Robert Watson Watt, strange target of his radar plot. And as and thus with others I could mention, a victim of his own invention. I share that with you this morning, not merely for the comedic relief, but because we're going to see the very same irony within our text this morning of Haman, a man who falls victim to his own invention. As we've read in Esther already, Haman has had a gallows prepared for Mordecai. But these will be the very gallows he himself will hang upon. His plot has already begun to fall apart as he, we saw last week, was required, commanded by the king to parade Mordecai through the city, placing a a robe around him, putting him on one of the king's horses and proclaiming to the people, this is what happens for the man whom the king delights to honor. Even his friends and family, as as Haman returns to his house, mourning, humiliated, even his own family are, are seeing the writing on the wall and telling him, you're beginning to fall. And it's in this moment as they tell that he is beginning to fall. Oh, this mic's getting a little crazy. I'm going to move to the handheld here. But it's in this moment that he's interrupted by some of the king's men who quickly summon him and hasten him to return for Esther's second banquet. Thank you, Jason. All right, we're back. They quickly summon him to Esther's second banquet. And if you've been with us, this has been a long process getting to this moment of our text this morning. Esther has already risked her life to go into the presence of the king. And when he says, what do you request? What is it that you're asking? And I'll give it to you, Esther. She says, I want you to come to a banquet tomorrow night. And so him and Haman come to a banquet. And at the banquet, he asks her, what would you have me give to you, Esther? What is it that you request? And she says, I really want you to come to a banquet tomorrow night, and I'll tell you. And so here we are, second banquet, third time he's asked her what she is requesting. And finally, we get an answer. But this comes as Haman has just been humiliated as Mordecai has just been honored, and as Haman's family has already, without even realizing it, prophetically told him, your downfall is coming, that they approach the second banquet. And the king asks once again the question, what is it that is your petition, Queen Esther? But you know what they say, the third time's the charm. And this time, Esther has an answer for him. This time, Esther will both unveil her own identity as a Jew, but also the true identity of Haman, the scheming, wicked man who has plotted against some of the king's most honored and appreciated people. Esther's response begins like this. She says, if I have found favor In your sight, O king. If I have found favor in your sight. That could also be translated, if I found grace in your eyes, king. Esther doesn't demand anything. She appeals to the king on the basis of his favor and grace toward her. Reminds me of Paul when he appeals to the people in Romans 12, 1 and 2, when he says... I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He beseeches them 
by the mercies of God. Here, Esther, she appeals to the king based on his, his mercy and grace. And she says, if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request, for we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. Much like Moses in the book of Exodus, who goes before Pharaoh on behalf of his people, Esther appeals to the king on behalf of hers. But she begins by adding this personal element to it. She doesn't just ask, spare my people. She said, let my life be given to me and my people. She aligns with them, positions herself in their camp. In fact, we see Moses do the same thing in one of the most bold prayers you'll ever read in Scripture in Exodus 32, 31 and 32, when he said, Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. And is that a bold prayer for a leader to make? Lord, forgive them for this wicked sin that they've done. But if not, blot me out of your book as well. Both of these examples, both Esther and Moses, they point to something. A distinguishing character trait of a true intercessor on behalf of the Lord and its compassion. Compassion. The, the origin of this word helps us to grasp the true breadth and significance of compassion. In Latin, compati means suffering with. Compassion means someone else's heartbreak becomes your heartbreak. Another suffering, it becomes your suffering. True compassion, it changes the way we live. It's more than just saying, I want to understand why you feel that way. It's, it's feeling what you feel and being brought into action to do something about it. It's placing yourself in someone else's shoes. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, We must learn to regard people less in light of what they do or omit to do and more in the light of what they suffer. A man who knew full well what it was to look at a people suffering and be brought to the point of saying, I have to do something about this, even at the cost of his own life. This is why we read that people were moved with compassion, because compassion draws you to action. Esther has risked her life on behalf of her people. She is moved with compassion. We're reminded this morning that, as Hebrews 4.15 tells us, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That we have a God who is compassionate towards us who has walked as we walked, yet without sin, who can understand and relate with our weaknesses. A God who is full of compassion towards us. And how are we to respond in light of our compassionate Savior? Colossians 3, 12 and 13 tells us, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. Esther didn't stand up in her tower trying to hide from the problems of her people. She didn't turn a blind eye and say, Mordecai, figure out another way. I'm not going to do it. She made their problem her problem. Now, the reality is, just as Mordecai had previously made her aware of, whether she liked it or not, she couldn't escape it. It was her problem as well. 
and we are no different today. The problem in politics, the problem in the school system, the problem in our families, the problem in our cities and states and our nation, our world as a whole, is not someone else's problem, it's our problem. It's the problem of sin. It's the problem none of us can escape on our own. In fact, I was listening to a pastor the other day talk about when he knows a marriage is going to fail as he's counseling a couple. And he says he sees it time and time again when he asks the couple, tell me what you think the problem is. And when both of them say the other person, he knows this marriage is doomed if there's not a change in perspective. He says, it doesn't matter how far gone they are. If I just hear them recognize they're a part of the problem, there's hope. But when we begin to point the finger and say the problem is someone else's, it's not my own. They have to figure that out. They have to deal with that. We're doomed for failure. It's a problem of sin. And it's a problem that we've played a part in. It's a problem that we've found the solution to, though, in Christ. How are we trying to bring that solution to the problem? Esther, she does the wisest thing she can do with her problem. She takes it to the only one who can bring a solution to it. She brings it before the king. Church, bring people to Christ. Christ is the answer to their deepest problem. People don't need a better system. They need a Savior. And you know that Savior. Are you introducing him to others? May our hearts break once again for the lost. And may we be a people that move with compassion and recognize our calling of reconciliation to a people with a problem in need of a savior. If Esther doesn't go before the king, the problem doesn't get solved. It's interesting that she makes a distinguishing remark to the king as she makes this request. She makes mention in here that if, if me and my people were just sent away as slaves... I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. She wants to make note of the fact of how extreme this decree was and how much she would have settled for and said, I would not have even brought it up if we would have just been sold as slaves. I could have even swallowed that and said, you know what, we'll just do it. No, but... But this wicked man, Haman, has seen fit to have our entire people killed and annihilated. And she also makes a note here that no matter how many more women could be brought before the king, nothing would compensate for the loss of his queen. No other person could fill the role of a man like Mordecai. No, she said, doesn't matter who you try and fill it with. Nothing else could compensate. I love that she's appealing both to the heart and the head of this king. She's being both practical and emotional in her appeal. And it speaks to the king. It pricks him in the heart, and he's drawn to action. And the king begins to ask the question, Who is he? Where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? The king is now out for blood. This is the right response of any man who sees his wife in danger. And you want to see the real anger and wrath of a man? Do something to harm or hurt his wife. And in this moment, a king that we see a track record of having a very bad temper that can boil up to the point that he is just acting out of his mind and then when he hears that someone has a plot to try and kill his wife, he says, where is he? Let me at him. Where is he? Who is he? Who does he think he is to do this against the king? 
No, rightfully so. He steps in as the protector to seek and, af- and find and then eliminate the threat to his bride. She says, the adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. Esther's been very strategic and all- also, some might argue, even a little too quiet and shy about her approach in all of this to make the king aware of it. But in this moment, Esther doesn't pull back any punches. She says, oh, you want to know? That man sitting at the table with us, this adversary, this enemy, this wicked man, Haman, it's him. You're looking for blood. You're looking for the man. He's sitting right there at the table with us tonight. No more Mrs. Nice Girl. There's a time to be silent and there's a time to speak up. Esther doesn't hold back anymore. She calls him an adversary. She calls him an enemy. And she calls him wicked straight to his face. And rightfully so. I think there's something we can learn from Esther's boldness in this moment. Never be ashamed, afraid, or silent when it comes to calling what is evil, evil. When it comes to calling wicked what is clearly wicked. Romans warns us of those who do the exact opposite. In Romans 1.18, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And we live in a world that is constantly trying to water down what is wicked. To try and give an excuse for it. To try and give an explanation for it. To try and make it just seem a little less bad. And it's okay if you don't agree with it, but don't call it wicked. And don't call it evil. And don't call it wrong. Keep that to yourself. Now, we as a church must be a people that call out the evil around us and promote the truth of God's word. That don't hesitate to say the truth, that don't apologize for it. And in a world where people are constantly trying to call evil good and good evil, your voice is necessary. Esther's voice in this moment in history is necessary. It's critical. And in a moment when many people could have spoken up that would have never got the king's ear, God called her for such a time as this to use the authority and the influence she had to speak this word to the king. And look at the response of Haman in this moment. We read, Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Haman is exposed before the king. He's got no excuse good enough in this moment for what he's done. There's no apology sincere enough to make right his wrong. There's no influence he could possibly have with the king that is great enough to override the queen and to escape what now he knows awaits him. And in this moment, the king in his fury and his wrath does something a little unexpected. Immediately we read that he arises up in his wrath and he goes into the palace garden. He just storms out of the room, maybe to try and figure out what to do with this whole situation, maybe to to put together a plan. We don't really get the details But what we do know is that the moment he leaves, Haman stands there before the queen pleading for his life because he knows what's awaiting him. This prideful, cunning, and self-centered man reduced to a whimpering coward before the queen as he sees the writing on the wall. 
Note the irony even in this moment where the man who was so angry previously that one Jew, Mordecai, would not bow down before him, and now here he is bowing down and pleading before Esther the Jew. And the fulfillment of his wife's words as he falls before the Jews in his guilt and shame. But the king quickly comes back, and as he comes back into the room, what does he find but Haman falling on the couch where Esther was? And the king says, will he even assault the queen with me in the house? And they covered Haman's face. Now we have to understand some of the customs of the day to fully grasp the king's anger in this moment as he enters back in. It was Persian custom to recline during a meal, and had Haman followed harem protocol, he would have left Esther's presence with the king. He would not be found alone in this room with the queen. Now, although it was common Near Eastern gesture of repentance to, to seize the feet and kiss the feet of the one that you were repenting to, such behavior was completely inappropriate with a woman of the harem, much less the queen herself. So strict was harem protocol that the king's interpretation of Haman's behavior would have probably been the same even if Haman had merely knelt before Esther with no physical contact at all. But instead, the king approaches that room and he finds him laid out over the couch where she is. And we don't know for sure that his motives were anything but just pleading for his life. Some try and paint a picture that, that maybe Haman in this moment is trying to sexually take advantage of Esther. And is that possible? That could have been part of what the king's thinking as he sees this scene when he approaches, but I doubt that's the motivation as much as Haman just pleading for his life, just begging and trying to do anything to get Esther to appeal to the king to spare him. But nonetheless, the king walks back into the room, already filled with rage over what Haman has done, and now sees him laid out on the couch where his wife is. He's crossed the line, and the king is not one to be gracious or patient in these moments. And as the king finishes making his statement of disbelief, they cover Haman's face, a custom of their day for a condemned prisoner. We saw last week Haman cover his head as he was mourning in humiliation. This week we see his head covered for execution. And as they cover his head and they begin to take him away, one of the eunuchs, Harbana, says to the king, Look, there's a gallows that he's built that's 50 cubits high at his house. He made it for Mordecai, the one who spoke good on the king's behalf. It's standing at the house of Haman right now, and the king says, Go hang him on that. Not only does Haman have against him the plot against the Jews to have them killed, which involved the very queen. Not only on top of that has he just been found in a moment laying over the couch where the queen is, but now it's revealed to the king that even more so he had another plot in play to have Mordecai, the man the king just had honored throughout the city, hung on this gallows. This man has just gone from bad to worse as his plot is revealed. And the king says, you just take him right now and hang him on that. No hesitation, no question. This man is guilty as charged and deserving of death. And we read, so they hanged him on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And then the king's wrath subsided. Proverbs 11.8 says, The righteous is delivered from trouble, and it comes to the wicked instead. And in this moment, so much has taken place for this one short chapter, these few short verses, where we see everything unfold. And Esther is unveiled as a Jew, 
Haman is exposed as a wicked adversary and enemy of the king. Mordecai is protected. Haman is killed. The righteous were delivered. And the trouble comes upon the wicked instead. But here's what we have to do in this moment. If you're going to read scripture correctly, we love to look at scripture and make ourselves the hero. In David and Goliath, we're always David killing the giant. When Moses leads the people through the Red Sea, yeah, we're going to be Moses and we're going to lead people to these new places. We see a man like Paul who has this great transformation from being Saul, and we're like, yeah, that's my story, and I'm a new creation, and I'm... And we always want to pair in ourselves as the hero and not the villain. And in a text like this, it's very easy for us to see ourselves as the Esther and the Mordecai that were honored and did the right thing and spoke out. And yet what we have to do, if we're going to be honest, is allow the mirror of Scripture to reveal to us this morning, you and I are Haman. We're Haman. We were an enemy of the king, an adversary of God, at enmity with God, lost in our sin and wickedness, and deserving of the gallows. I love how David Guzik puts it, Bible commentator. He says, The death of a substitute satisfied the wrath of the king. In the case of Mordecai and Haman, it was the guilty dying in the place of the innocent. In the case of us and Jesus, it is a matter of the innocent dying in the place of the guilty. You see, the tool the enemy meant to bring defeat would in fact be the weapon through which God would bring victory. For Haman, it was the gallows. For Jesus, it was the cross torture device of the Romans that God was going to use to defeat sin and death and the grave once and for all. So that just as King Ahasuerus' wrath subsided at the substitutionary death of Haman for Mordecai, we sing and celebrate as we sang this morning till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. We celebrate the victory that came through what the enemy thought was his greatest weapon against us. Esther and Mordecai in this moment experience a victory as they see Haman killed on the very gallows he made. An end to the enemy that has caused so many problems for God's people. But you and I, every Sunday as we come together, we come together and remind each other of the celebration that we can have because of the victory Jesus had on the cross for us. The gallows was prepared for us. In fact, We deserved it. We've all worked in sin. We all are deserving of the wages of that sin, which is death. It's not wrong for us to receive that penalty. It's right. It's just. It's true. That's what we deserve. And in a moment, we want to celebrate the death of this enemy, Haman, and the victory of God's people. We have to realize if that was our story, we'd be on that gallows with him. If it was not for Jesus, who came and lived and died and took our place on the cross. Now, we always think of a gallows like there's this hangman's noose there, and he's, he's being hung and strangled. But the reality is the gallows that they would have prepared in Persia at this time was a massive wooden stake with a sharp end that they would pull you down upon and that you would live in this excruciating pain, sometimes for hours, even days, before your body would finally die. It was gruesome. It was agonizing. This is what Haman had prepared for Mordecai. 
but it was what he himself would be placed upon. And Jesus came and died the most gruesome and agonizing death we, we could possibly imagine on a different piece of wood, a cross, so that he could be the substitute for us, so that we could also experience the victory that comes at the defeat of our enemy, like Esther and Mordecai are going to experience moving forward. But here's the reality within our text this morning. Those outside of Christ will stand before the king of kings one day just as guilty as Haman, just as helpless, and just the same sent out from his presence for eternity. They will fall victim to their own devices. The sin they clung to will pull them down into eternal death. Then and only then will the wrath of God subside. As justice is served, as a fair penalty is given for their guilt. But the grace of God we stand in today, the hope we have in tomorrow, is that justice and mercy meet at the foot of the cross of Jesus. Where we can find forgiveness for sin, acceptance in his presence, and his wrath can be subsided because of what Jesus did for you. But the only reason we can truly appreciate that, the only way, rather, we can truly appreciate that is when we read the text clearly and understand who we are. That we were the enemy of God. That we were deserving of death. That we, like sheep, had gone astray. We had turned each one to his own way. But because Jesus came and made our sin his own, his blood has washed us white as snow. This morning, as I invite the worship team to come back up, We're going to be closing with a few songs of worship, but I want to really truly challenge you this morning to allow the Lord to reveal your heart. To show you where, where there is wickedness within your own life. Because he's given us a call each and every day to take up our cross and follow him, to die to ourselves as we sing to be crucified with him. That he might live that we might decrease and he might increase. But if we're not careful, we can continue to fall back into this place where we paint ourselves as the hero, where we lessen the grace that's been given to us, and we lose our appreciation for the incredible act of God on our behalf that while we were still sinners, he died for us. But may the Lord once again this morning stir within us that gratitude and praise. To understand how far we had fallen. The gap we couldn't cross. And the God who made a way where there was no way. So that we could be called children of God. And I want to ask this morning before we close in prayer. Before we move to a time of worship. And you can receive prayer for anything this morning. That the Lord would put on your heart. Is there anybody this morning here today who has not made that decision? Because if you haven't made the decision to give your life to Jesus, to surrender to the King of Kings, to allow Him to take the penalty for your sin, you're in that place that Haman was in, where there's no excuse for your sin. There's no apology that's good enough. There's no way of escape from what's coming to you except through Jesus alone. And we don't want to share the hope that Jesus has without giving you an opportunity this morning to experience it and to receive it. That no matter how much sin is in your life, no matter how much sin there's been, His grace abounds so much more. And no matter how far you've gone from God, 
He's that father for the prodigal son that is running after you, just waiting for you to come back to him. And his invitation to you this morning is, come to me, and I will give you rest. He's done the work. He's paid the price. He's made the way. His invitation to you this morning is to receive it, to believe it, to walk by faith in his finished work. Is there anybody this morning that needs to make that decision? We want to pray for you. We want to welcome you into the family. We want to celebrate with all of heaven that decision. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand if that's you? And I'm trusting and believing this morning that we are in the presence of God's people, the family of Christ. People who recognize that to be true and have made that decision to follow Jesus. Then my challenge to you this morning, believer, is as we spend this time in worship and prayer is sing out like a people who truly believe that. That you were an enemy of God that is now a part of his family that you were a person that was lost without any hope apart from Christ, but because of his love for you, because of his kindness, he has led you to repentance. Let's sing out and respond in a way that is worthy of that sacrifice and honoring to his name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me as we close in these songs? Lord, we come before you this morning in gratitude and praise that you are a God who can save to the utmost, that there is no sin too great that your blood cannot wash it clean, that there is no person too far gone that your grace cannot go further for. Lord, we pray that this time of worship and prayer as we finish our time together would be a sweet-smelling aroma to you, that it would be honoring to your name, that it would be worthy to represent you. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you were moved with compassion to save a people who had no hope apart from you. Lord, send us out of here today with that same compassion for people that don't know you that they would know us by our love. And that we would speak the truth in love. And it's in your mighty name, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.